Thank you, David. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon to this panel discussion on open science in times of global crisis. The goal of the discussion is um, uh, to uh, see, to, to explore how open science can help overcome global crisis, such as the corona pandemic. But that is only one perspective. The other perspective is that we also want to highlight the implication of such engagement for researchers applying open science principles to address global crisis. With me on the panel are four renowned researchers, and I would like to introduce uh, them to you. Some of you um, have already uh, given a presentation here, so you might be known to the audience. And I would like to start with Anna, Anna Persic. Uh, she's acting uh, Chief of Science Policy and Partnerships Section at the Division of Science Policy and Capacity Building at the UNESCO headquarters in Paris. Hi, Anna. Welcome to this panel. Let us know, where are you now at the moment? Yes, hello, uh, Klaus. I'm here in Paris, uh, actually in the office today. I uh, usually uh, at home these past few months. But today I'm here in, uh, in, in the office, uh, kind of a strange feeling uh, in UNESCO headquarters, which is quite empty now and usually mm. all bubbly. So, uh, um, yeah, here calling from Paris. Yeah, I, I'm also in the office, uh, empty here in ZBW also. I'm here because here I have three different internet connections, so I uh, doubt that I will have any technical problems. That is the reason why I went to the ZBW this afternoon. Next panelist is Jessica, Jessica Polka. She serves as executive director of Asabio, a research-driven nonprofit organization working to promote innovation and transparency in life sciences, publishing in areas such as preprinting and open peer review. Jessica, where are you? Let us know. Uh, thanks, Klaus. I'm in my home office in Boston, Massachusetts, where the snow is currently coming down. Uh, it's, we've had quite a, a lot of uh, winter weather over the past few weeks. So I'm very happy to be here today. Okay, so we keep our fingers crossed that the snow will not freeze the internet connections. Okay. And our next panelist is Paolo Masuzzo. She's a data scientist um, for a corporate organization, an independent researcher by the Institute of Globally Distributed Open Research and Education, and spends a lot of free time um, for advocating for free and fair access to knowledge. Paola, where are you? Hi there. Hi, everybody. I'm in Ghent, Belgium, and I'm at home, like I've been yeah. for the past few months as well. Uh, we also had a little bit of snow uh, last week, and now it's completely gone. Okay, same here. Today is a sunny day here in the northern part of Germany. I can look out of my window. I see the um, Baltic Sea. I have a fantastic view. And I hope it's the same in, in, in Ghent these days. How is it in Berlin, uh, Tobias? I guess you are based in Berlin. Is that correct? Yes, so that's Tobias, correct. Tobias is a systems biologist. He is working for the, for the Max Delbrück Center for Molecular Medicine. And he has a strong attitude for open social innovation and digitization. So how is it in Berlin these days? Well, it's also quite sunny today. Um, the snow that was here for the last few days is now completely gone again. Um, it's almost like springtime, actually. Oh, okay. And yeah, I'm sitting in, in the Institute, but also in a single office today. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, before we start, I would like to invite the audience uh, to also contribute to this panel on an ongoing basis, please submit your questions to the panel or to the individuals on the panel in the chat. I have a second device here on which I can monitor the chat, on which I can monitor the questions uh, which come from the audience, and I will ensure that um, uh, these uh, questions will be forwarded to uh, the panelists. So, everybody is ready? Then I would like uh, to open uh, uh, the panel with a question to all, and I would like you uh, to answer this question one after the other. And um, to start with, um, well, as you know, the objective of the panel uh, is to showcase how each of us can apply open science principles 
to help or to contribute, overcome the current global corona pandemic. Maybe you want to share with us what is your contribution to apply open science to overcome the current global pandemic. And let me start with Paola. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I think it's a, it's a very interesting question and uh, I wish that I had uh, uh, a list of uh, tangible actions with uh, um, all the effects that these actions have had. But unfortunately, I have to share with you some failures uh, as well as some uh, success stories. Um, when I look at uh, what I personally do, so as you said already, Klaus, uh, uh, I'm a data scientist uh, uh, by day and uh, an open access and open science advocate by night. Um, and one of the things that uh, uh, I believe uh, um, has really um, has really shown to be to be clear to everybody in these very difficult times uh, um, is that uh, citizens have the right and have the need to know what's going on. So one of the things uh, uh, that I have been involved with uh, on the front line almost uh, is with um, um, a very um, uh, big uh, uh, campaign that we launched in Italy. Because yes, I am sitting in in, uh, in Belgium and I follow, of course, uh, um, Belgian uh, uh, life and the Belgian news and the world. But I'm Italian, so I also care very much about what's going on in Italy. And um, we have launched uh, a couple of months ago a big campaign. Uh, which basically asks uh, uh, the Italian government uh, to open up uh, to the matter and to the limit that it's possible uh, all the data uh, around uh, COVID-19 uh, COVID trends. Because one thing is to share uh, numbers and to share uh, dashboards and to share infographics. And another thing is also to give uh, people uh, uh, the means and the tools to be able to cope with this information, to be able to cope with uh, um, everything that this information tries to, 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 to give across. So um, I would like to say that this has been a very um, somehow successful campaign in the sense that we have collected many, many signatures. So we have talked at the Senate. There are uh, um, actions uh, that are being taken places and politicians and policy uh, makers that are listening to our demands and our rights. Um, but it has, it has also been, on the other hand, a very uh, tiring uh, because um, you would believe that these rights, uh, now the digital rights uh, of uh, transparency and open communication uh, would be there by default and unfortunately this is still not the case. But yes, so my major contribution and the thing that I believe in most uh, is uh, the disclosure of data, open data, wherever and whenever it's possible. Yeah, we, we will come uh, to um, uh, how well we are heard by the uh, policy makers in, in the next uh, questions. Thank you very much for this intro statement. And Jessica, what's your contribution? ASAP Bio focuses, uh, especially in the last year, on the use of preprints, which have undergone a lot of attention during the COVID-19 pandemic and played a major role in not only accelerating discoveries that have led to treatments uh, and our understanding of the virus, um, but also impact of policy in a way that they previously have not done before. Um, you know, really for the first time, many people um, outside of uh, basic biomedical research are either looking at preprints, reading news articles that discuss preprints, um, and you're know, being confronted with literature that has not yet undergone the peer review process. So I think this presents challenges in communicating the process of science to a broad audience, um, but it also raises the need for there to be clear information available about uh, what preprints are, the servers uh, that are offering preprints, the screening policies uh, at those servers, so for our part, um, you know, we've maintained a list of the policies and practices of preprint servers. We maintain resources to try to help people understand the potential uses of preprints and how they fit into the broader communication landscape. Uh, we've started a project called Preprints in the Public Eye, where we convene stakeholders to talk about how preprints are represented in the media and how they can be more clearly labeled by both preprint servers researchers and institutions who are discussing them and journalists as well. Uh, we also are really encouraged by the emergence of many peer review initiatives or commenting initiatives, some of which have sprung up at individual universities and others that engage early career researchers and others. 
And we're really interested in promoting more engagement with this type of commenting uh, because, you know, there's this type of community uh, feedback on preprints is really essential to help put these things into context. Um, you know, in the absence of a uh, very rigorous screening process, um, which enables preprints to be really fast, this type of open discussion and open communication around the meaning and interpretation of preprints is really essential to help readers put them into context. So our, yeah, in, in brief, I would say that preprints and the review of preprints is something that we are working to try to promote and ensure that their use is productive as possible. Thanks a lot. That's a great initiative, Jessica. Thank you very much for this intro statement. And Tobias, what is your contribution in terms of open yeah. science? Um, so we started, uh, when, when, the, when the pandemic reached Germany, there was a big hackathon uh, via versus virus. And um, there was a great need to increase testing capacity. So I stood with other people in the lab and we thought, okay, let's just use all our cyclers and everything we have. Um, and we came across many other people um, who had the same idea. So we started a platform called LabHive. Um, and the goal is to bridge the gap between research labs and diagnostic labs, basically, so that you can freely share resources and also knowledge. I mean, people who can do these tests are also a resource, so to speak. And um, we want to, to um, yeah, make sure that the tests reach the places where they are really needed. And um, this, this was our first goal. And the second goal was to um, address the issue that you can only manage what you can measure. And um, also measuring test capacity. This in, in Germany, especially, is a very s relatively slow process. Um, there's one report in a PDF file once a week um, where you can get these numbers. But if you really have to manage a pandemic, um, you need access to this this information very fast and in a very uh, localized manner. And um, this is something we are trying to implement now, but this is the same, goes in the same direction as, as Paola mentioned. Um, this is also a critical resource and governments, they, yeah, they tend to try to keep these informations a bit boxed in. Um, and then there are also many, many other interest groups, of course, involved in mm. that. And so this is this is quite a challenge. I mean, there are, there's progress in terms, for example, in, in hospital capacity. There's a really a kind of daily life view in Germany now. Um, but yeah, our, our goal is really to, to build um, our focus is, of course, not only Germany, but um, at the moment, we have the best insights into the market there. Also, and I mean, testing and health capacities are, mm -hmm. of course, also a yeah, big market in the end. And this is also something you, you have to address when you want to just disseminate information. And, and Tobias, if you uh, say uh, sharing of resources, do you mean computing capacity so that you have built up like a virtual hyperscaler with connecting all the, your machines to one another? Or is it more about storage capacities or any other types of resources? Um, it's more really um, the focus is PCR test resources. So people who can do these tests, the materials you need, the devices you need, um, for one use case, for example, imagine you have a lab and you do a lot of PCR tests and your cycler breaks down in a diagnostic lab. And you know, okay, well, across the street, there's a university and they surely have a lot of these devices, um, but you don't know who to ask. Yeah, I, I see. And Understood. this then helps. <laughs> and now, Anna, um, what is your or UNESCO's contribution to overcome the current global pandemic? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, I, I, I'm gonna just focus my answer to what uh, our section and our 
division has been doing because UNESCO, as you know, has been very much involved in different aspects around the crisis, uh, on the front of the education, of culture, and then communication and sciences. So there's a lot of action uh, from UNESCO as a UN organization. But I will focus here really on, uh, on open science and what the, uh, our uh, section has been doing. Um, I think the most important part of really advocating for openness uh, in the times of COVID-19, but also kind of trying to use this opportunity in a way to say this is something that needs to become a norm and not only in the crisis situation should we um, strive to have a scientific knowledge that is more open, that is more accessible, that is more participatory, that, um, that you know, applies these principles of open science. So very early um, in the crisis, I think it was in, um, in March last year, actually, uh, UNESCO convened this big meeting of ministers of science, technology and innovation to advocate for openness of scientific uh, data results, etc. And in some countries, it, it really did make an effect and uh, they did open some of the platforms and some of the data that they have. In other countries, it has followed a process that, uh, that it followed. But I think it was a very, very good uh, starting point to kind of um, uh, advocate for uh, open science in times of, uh, of crisis. Uh, we had some 130 member states uh, at the ministerial level present. It was an online conference um, and, it, and it really did make a lot of waves uh, at the international level. Similarly, in October last year, our Director General, together with the Director General of um, the World Health Organization and the uh, United Nations uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights, they've launched an appeal for open science um, in combating COVID-19. Um, with additional, um, you know, kind of recommendations to countries as to what that would mean. So really at that highest level at the UN, uh, an, another call was launched uh, mm -hmm. in favor of, uh, of open science. And then, of course, um, as I was saying in the, in the opening for those who, who were here before, uh, we were just starting this process of uh, global recommendation on open science. And it kind of came in, in a good time because people were very much confronted with what it means and how it can be used and how you actually do need an international framework for open science to implement op and operationalize open science as we move along and to make it as just and as fair as possible. Because as we saw, there's a lot of benefits from open science and opening data and information, but it also comes with a lot of responsibility, accountability, uh, and the need for um, uh, fairness and, and, and equitability. So the, the, the process, I think, of developing the recommendation in a way benefited from the situation. We really had regional consultations that were extremely rich. Lots of people came on board because the global situation has made people very much aware of what, uh, of what it actually means. Um, and then, of course, we had uh, other initiatives more concrete into trying to open access uh, to certain databases, point our member states uh, to certain platforms, uh, doing some trainings for uh, open data, open, uh, uh, open access, etc. Uh, and also a, a big portion on open educational resources, because that was really uh, one of the key issues uh, that we saw were extremely important in this time crisis for students, but also for uh, all the other stakeholders in the landscape um, in the world. Okay, thanks a lot. The first questions from the audience are already coming in after your intro statements, so I will just take two of them. The first one is uh, as follows. Are there existing best practices for large-scale decentralized COVID-19 open analysis in one or the other research institute on a local, regional or international level by discipline or otherwise focused? What do you see as circumventable obstacles? Maybe that is a question I would like to forward to Tobias first. It's, so the question is, do you, are you aware of any best practices for decentralized um, COVID-19 open analysis? Um, I mean, analysis can be a broad thing. Uh, if you if you mean um, 
beta, of course, for example, for the new variants now popping up, uh, we have GSATE, um, which is a big storage for sequence data. Um, then there's Crowdfight 19, which is a, basically a huge mailing list uh, where people can uh, contribute to specific tasks, which is another thing. Um, I hope this is, goes into the direction of the, of the question. Anybody else from the panel who wants to add on that? Okay, then I um, uh, go to the next uh, question, um, uh, which I think uh, Jessica um, uh, could be well answered by you. And the question is um, that there are already ready and functionally uh, um, uh, good open peer review um, uh, systems for COVID-related manuscripts. Why is uptake still so slow? <laughs> it's a fantastic question, and I wish that I knew conclusively the answer to this. Um, I, I think that there's a few things at play. Number one is that we, I, I think in, in um, many areas of science, we don't really have a culture for openly criticizing one another. Um, I think we're very used to having a situation in which peer review happens behind closed doors where reviewers are anonymous. And I certainly can appreciate how it's important to uh, protect the identity of people who are junior in their career, vulnerable for various other reasons. Um, but, you know, in, in uh, traditional journal peer review, we have a, an editor who acts as a moderator and ensures, uh, <laughs> you would hope, at least a certain level of civility in the discussion. Um, I think that there is a concern um, coming from authors that perhaps open peer review might be um, kind of unprofessional or it, it might actually make authors you know, look bad, even if it is professional, as a result of the fact that so few of the concerns um, and questions that we have about science are actually aired publicly. Um, you know, I think that we have a uh, real kind of, perhaps as a holdover of the system of publishing a static version of record, we're making corrections um, and, you know, any changes to that manuscript is highly stigmatized and can result in a, you know, retraction, which is considered to be, um, you know, something that ideally you would want to reduce that barrier and make people more comfortable about changing their science uh, or changing their reports as, as their uh, understanding evolves. And this is something that is enabled, of course, by preprints. Um, so it, all of this is to say that I think that there that um, we there's a, a large cultural shift that I think needs to happen. Um, you know, obviously researchers are extremely taxed in their time, as well. Um, you know, I think that uh, it, there's something. Um, you know, it, there's a sense of of duty and and responsibility that I think researchers have when there is an editor inviting participation in the traditional peer review process. But um, to provide unsolicited comments on a preprint is, I think, some, something else. There's there, the kind of the social calculus of deciding to do that uh, or not is, is different. And of course, there are high profile cases of preprints which have um, either been withdrawn. Um, for example, there was a preprint about uh, spike protein similarity to HIV, which received dozens of comments within a very short period of time. So I do think that there is a point at which the urgency of commenting surpasses these social inhibitions. Um, but the question now becomes, how can we apply um, uh, you know, much of the effort that is already being uh, placed in reading papers and translate that into actionable feedback and helpful context for readers? Um, I, th I think it's a question of normalizing um, this behavior and practice, creating some incentives, um, both possibly you know, social incentives for you know, recognizing and appreciating this work. Um, but yeah, I'd be curious to hear other opinions on this as well. Are there other opinions on the panel? Uh, uh, if, if I may, yeah, I wanted to add, I think Jessica makes, of course, um, splendid points. Um, and I, I believe that there are two things in the, the one is the fact that we as researchers are not used enough to talk about failing, talk about the mistakes we make, the errors we make, 
um, because with years, with centuries of science, we've built a system where everything needs to work while we know that actually every day a lot of experiments simply fail, that errors slip through manuscripts. I mean, we are humans. Uh, thinking the opposite would be would be actually the mistake. So we're not used enough to talk about failures, but mm. we focus too much on uh, doing excellent science and everything that works just fine. And the other thing is that I believe there's still a lack of professional training in doing peer review. We take for granted that people uh, are going to learn it on the job. I mean, I learned uh, to do professional, I hope, <laughs> peer review because at a certain point, my, my PI threw me under the bus and he told me, here, I have a couple of requests for peer reviews. You do the topic, you do them. Provide as many insights as you can. But I mean, that's not really, it's, it's a much more complex and profound um, mm. dynamic and process. So I also believe that early career researchers, students who want to pursue this type of, of career need to, to be trained as, as early as possible into construct, constructive feedback, constructive criticism, um, which basically boils down to what Jessica indeed was saying. Uh, how do we approach peer review professionally and not just, you know, writing comments because it's, 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 it's possible. You don't just say something because it's possible. You need to support it as well. So it, it's, it's a phenomenon that takes training and skills, and those needs to be properly developed. So if, uh, I mean, be, be, what you said is we don't have a culture of failure in the science system. There is a lack of professional peer review competences. And this actually brings me to the next question from the audience, which received a couple of votes. And um, uh, maybe that's also a reason why we are so slow in taking up uh, the new possibilities like open peer reviewing, open preprints. And the question is, um, this global crisis has shown the many benefits of open science. That is clear. I think we all have seen that. How can we ensure that we do not go back to the old, old days when this is all over? So maybe that is one reason why we are slow, so slow in taking up the new normal, because we want to go back to the old normal. Um, once the pandemic is over. So who do we need to convince that this should be the new normal, that open science should be the new normal and and, and how? And I think, uh, Paola, you, you made a good exercise with the uh, campaign you started in Italy, right? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's as a matter of fact, at the end of the day, it's indeed an exercise, right? Because if you want this, uh, it, it's obvious that when this pandemic started, we as society, we as a world were not prepared in many possible ways. We, we, we didn't see it coming, of course, and we were not prepared. Mm. Most of governments were not prepared. Citizens were not prepared. Even scientists were not prepared. But somehow we managed to, you know, um, preprint, uh, uh, open data, collaborate, uh, let's speed up, let's put our brains in motion together because we need to get out of this uh, dark time as soon as we can, as fast as we can. How do we make sure now these lessons that we have learned to stay, we would have to convince a lot of people, actually. Um, I still believe that we're not there. And uh, indeed, Klaus, as you say, the, the campaign that I'm talking about uh, to ask the Italian government to open uh, COVID-19 data is just one of the all possible exercises. And that's what I believe that the voices of, of, of people who do activism, the voices of people who advocates for open science right now are really important. And chances that these voices are going to be heard, like Anna was saying, now chances are higher than wherever before, because now we're talking about this. Now the conversation has shifted and I don't believe the conversation will shift back, but the practice needs to stay. I, actually, it needs to even improve, I believe. Uh, Anna, can you add on this? Yeah, if, if, if I may, um, sure. Uh, I, 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 agree, I agree with Paula. And uh, um, I think what is really important moving forward is, uh, f first, it's, there is not just one person or one entity or one stakeholder to convince. It really is, the, 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 the open science system really is composed of a lot of different players. And I think that is also something that has come out very clearly uh, during the current uh, pandemics. And even though we talk about open science broadly here, 
very often even the communities within open science are kind of working in a in a in a separate way there is open access there is open data there is open software and even they don't necessarily come come together as much as they should and i think what is really important at this stage is to also address some of the challenges and some of the um some of the things that people just did not understand correctly about open science uh, I think we, as uh, you were saying about failures and how we have to, you know, be, own them as well, also owning potential risks of opening science, of open science, the challenges that we come. Uh, talking about it openly is also something really important because otherwise there will always be those who will not advocate for it because they haven't really understood it or because they have encountered the problem that maybe the others have not. So really being very clear about what the challenges are and how to go around them, sharing experiences, talking about it. An, it's an evolving process, right? We don't really know uh, how it's going to work. And also, I think, at least from our perspective, kind of a global perspective, it's very important to respect the diversity uh, from which every country, every discipline, every actor is coming from. So it's 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 not a one fits all approach. There is not like a global recipe as to how we do open science, but we 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 have to kind of um, have a conversation about it and allow for the diversity of you know pathways to open science to happen to happen as well. Because just saying now you have to transition to open science, it mm -hmm. it cannot. Happen. I mean, it's, it's, it will be very, very difficult. But, you know, having this pedagogical approach along the way and taking the time to explain different issues, IPRs, uh, preprints, uh, you know, how do the citizen come in? It's not like they're going to, uh, you know, diminish the quality of science. Open evaluation it doesn't mean that activists are coming in and evaluating scientific research and therefore... So there is a lot of things that need to be explained um, that, that people have uh, also seen during these pandemics. And I think this is going to be the most critical part going forward mm. to ensure that we keep on on this path towards uh, open science. Okay. Thank you. Um, and Anna, in, uh, in your intro statement, uh, you mentioned that you had a lot of support for your process to establish uh, the open science recommendations because there was the corona pandemic and everybody now perceives open science as a good um, yeah, facilitator to overcome the corona pandemic. And there is a question related to this. And this question is, um, how do we fight open washing to ensure that open science is uh, not just a fig leaf so that, you know, we wrap everything into open science and then it goes through and that would be as um, uh, the question uh, put it open washing washing that's not what we want so how how do you think can we overcome this uh, risk I, I think it's it ties a little bit back to what i was just saying and that is to be clear about what open science is what it's not uh where the benefits are for whom the benefits at which stage and how it's a complex process, and, and I think we have to communicate about it as a complex process and not trying to oversimplify and therefore just say, okay, uh, uh, it's open science, so it's good. It, it really doesn't work like that. And another thing is also, as I was saying, there are so many different players, and I think we have to listen to one another uh, in trying to understand how we can best move forward uh, uh, together. Uh, and, and I think there is... Um, there is a an, an innovation that has to happen in the way that we not just do science but in the way that we interact amongst uh, the, these different uh, actors instead of saying stakeholders we now prefer to saying actors because it really is actors of, of open science with their different roles to play and responsibilities to to have um so yes, of course, there is a there, there is a risk about open washing, mm. uh, but again, let's be honest about it and let's be very clear what open science is and, and is not, and where the boundaries are and where the limits are as well. So did the others um, run into such a situation that you were blamed for like using open science as a good label to get through your your ambitions, your wishes? 
Well, certainly not personally, um, to, to my knowledge, although <laughs> definitely uh, I, I do think that there is a uh, question about whether any open science tool is being used productively. Uh, for example, um, preprints um, are, uh, it, it's quite possible um, that there are benefits of preprints that are more uh, helping individual researchers versus the community as a whole. For example, um, as preprints are becoming more and more recognized, they function as a way to claim priority of discovery over research. Um, and you know, certainly that this uh, can you know, help motivate people to share their work early. However, um, I think where this runs into problems is if uh, people are posting a preprint but are unwilling to share the methods, uh, which has happened in a few isolated cases or where they have um, you know, perhaps forgotten to upload the methods with the manuscript, where there's not open data, where um, the resources are not shared. So that, in other words, um, it becomes a early uh, kind of flag planted on a finding that is not accompanied by the ability to reproduce and build upon that finding by others. So I definitely think that that is, is certainly a challenge. Um, you know, I, I think that obviously there's also um, many, many different uh, players in the preprint ecosystem, including publishers um, who you know see this as a way of engaging with manuscripts throughout their entire life cycle, um, which you know I think is is a motive um, that needs to be considered in all of this. Um, and you know, just just in general, that um, you know, certainly, I think that that um, we have to keep in mind, like what you know, what the overall goal of this is, which is to accelerate science for social benefit, uh, to enable broader participation, uh, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Okay. Somebody wants to add on that. If not, there is another question, which um, I think um, maybe Tobias uh, could start or try to answer it because you are working for a research institute. And the question is um, why there is a lot of enthusiasm for open science right now. We also see university and research budgets being cut around the world. So the budget um, goes down. And how do we make sure that this is not detrimental to open science activities which are vulnerable to these cuts. So the fear is there are more and more budget cuts in universities and research institutes and that this could be like a barrier for the further development of open science and I mean you mentioned that you uh, shared your PCR test resources. Maybe one reason was not you know because you wanted to become open but uh, because um, uh, well you, you had severe budget cuts with the Indian force <laughs> you to share the resources. No, so far, um, this is not definitely not the reason we, why we share things because, um, I mean, just for the immediate need, uh, it should be shared. Um, the, the other thing is, on the, on the other hand, there are big incentives now um, also to, to just share data to make data openly accessible there are um really also monetary incentives that you get a bit more of uh, research income so to speak um that you can when you when you actually publish in an open format and um this on the other hand then can actually again help to promote open science um of course um yeah publishing things is more expensive um when you do it open for the researcher but um yeah i well i don't i don't see it as a in a as a general threat for for open science um mm -hmm. i see it more as a threat for science of course for science as a yeah does anybody want to? Um, I, I just wanted to, to add perhaps uh, um, a thought, if I may, Klaus, um, on that. Uh, it's more of a, of a provo provocative, perhaps, thought. But if you, believe, if you think um, and if you calculate how much money research institutions worldwide spend uh, on, uh, on journal subscriptions every year, 
and you sum them up, um, then maybe you might start to, to look into where the, there are where there is space actually to to open up some budget, you know. Um, so I always say uh, perhaps a couple of subscri subscription less, a couple of cuts here and there, and more resources, uh, human resources, for example, to make sure that we know how to manage data, because data management is is now a need, and most of the universities, or at least a lot of universities, still don't have um, skilled human resources in place that you know, tell researchers what does it mean to have fair data, how do you publish data, what is a digital object identifier. Not everybody knows these things, not everybody has to. So do these budgets cut, um, are they going to have a bad uh, negative uh, effect on open science? Uh, no, if we actually find uh, the space to, to allocate for the money. And I think that it's a matter of priority. Sooner or later, we're all going to realize that journal subscriptions are do not serve science the way they used to or they shouldn't anymore just just to provoke a little bit perhaps but yes if i may please uh, yeah no but I, but i think um it, it is very important to keep advocating for investment in science technology innovation uh, in general i think there is this tendency of of budget cuts generally not just for open science or but for science uh and 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 there is real need for advocacy uh for the contrary because really we have seen that uh a, a better investment in sti systems policies infrastructures etc is really critical and i mean it, it it is critical for times of crisis but it's, it's critical for development it's critical for so many different things mm -hmm. so maybe now is the time to make these connections very visible as to how the science contribute to health how the science contributes to i don't know sdg sustainable development goals etc so that we do not lose money and if money has to be cut somewhere that it's and and it will probably have to be cut somewhere let's be honest i mean we're going to go through some probably you know, some crisis in, in, in economic terms as well, but that it's not cut from the science, um, from the science budgets, but possibly somewhere else. Uh, then if it is cut, as Paula was saying, of course, one can, uh, uh, one can see how it can be best distributed, but the idea would be really try not to cut the science budgets. On the contrary, I would say, this is the time to actually uh, increase them. Okay. Thanks a lot. Um, thank you also to our 161 viewers, which are attending this panel. And your um, uh, your questions are popping up here one after the other. So I will just uh, go to the next one from our attendees. And this one uh, um, goes to Paola and Jessica. It says, regarding your comments, Paola and Jessica, about researchers not being used to talking about failures, also, most funders still give more importance to excellent science, which is synonymous with successful science. So how do you think uh, can funders broaden their indicators? Well, just to say that I think that this is a problem that goes even beyond funders. That's certainly something that I think affects institutions. And I think it's really embedded the culture of not only science, but um, our entire society. We're, I think, as humans, attracted to stories. We're attracted to things that are kind of neat and easy to understand. Um, and, you know, th this is obviously something that affects what we value in terms of scientific output. Um, you know, I definitely, you know, do not have a uh, an easy answer, but I do think that there's some... Um, uh, kind of practices that can really help to promote open science. Um, obviously, uh, uh, open notebook science might be the ideal, but I love the idea of pre-registration as a way to, um, you know, in the case of a journal, perhaps evaluate the methods of a study, um, and regardless, and kind of commit to giving it um, the, uh, you know, airtime, regardless of what that finding is. I think the challenge is my background is in kind of um, very basic biochemistry, cell biology, and the um, kind of turnaround time for our experiments are very quick. And so, you know, I think that it's not that we're publishing a single study that is taking a certain amount of time. 
um, there, it's kind of an ongoing process of exploration. So I think one of the challenges is how do we adapt models like pre-registration um, to other domains of scholarship where uh, there's less of a commitment to a single, a single question. Um, yeah, I'm curious what others have to say as well. Yeah, Paola, you were also addressed in the question. Yes, um, I think Jessica makes uh, very good points, uh, as always. Um, I, I don't know if I have uh, an, an honest, uh, straightforward solution. I believe with years, uh, if we keep talking uh, um, about this, uh, these things will also become part of the natural conversation, um, will become the norm a little bit uh, uh, like... Uh, uh, the impact factor has become, unfortunately, for, for many years. Um, perhaps one thing is that uh, sometimes it's still not clear, and it took me also a little bit to realize that science, science is not static, and scientists do not produce products. They produce um, outputs, yes, they have to, um, but they also produce uh, processes. And if you look at science as, as a process that evolves, so that um, uh, self-correct uh, itself uh, and that keeps adjusting uh, um, and it keeps changing, uh, then you might also think, uh, um, why is it that we only evaluate, for example, research looking at the output? Why don't we give uh, at least not enough attention to all the blocks that um, uh, that person had to, to, to go through to arrive to that output. And if the output was uh, A or B, it was, uh, yes, the experiment was successful or, or no, the hypothesis was completely uh, wrong and the experiment had failed or whatever. But all those blocks that were put together, if they were put together in a transparent way, in a collaborative way, in an inclusive way, and, uh, you know, in a responsible way, they should also uh, constitute good science. So I think we didn't we didn't do ourselves a favor uh, some years ago when we uh, came up with the term open science. Um, it, it sounds perhaps a little bit of a joke now. Mm, now maybe that I think about it, uh, we should have just at certain point start talking about science done in a good way you know how do you do science in a responsible way and then you scrap this open that carries a lot of weight uh, on itself and all the pieces that need to fall into place they automatically fall into place if you also look at it from a from a dynamic from a process point of view not just looking at the output okay so the discussion about uh, excellence in science raised the question um, related to conferences, because conferences are a place where you can present your excellent outcomes of your research. And the question is to you, Anna, it's a simple one. Is UNESCO planning another open science conference like the one in uh, 2019? I, I certainly would like to say yes. Uh, now, I think uh, for UNESCO, open science has become uh, one of its priorities and we see from member states, they're really asking uh, for it. So yes, definitely, we would like to have some kind of open science forum or open science conference and make it uh, a regular thing. At the same time, you know, in different regions, um, UNESCO is driving these open science conferences. There is the CELAC conference coming up in, in Latin America. And in April, and I would actually really invite you to also be part of this other regional open science conferences to get a feeling of, you know, what are the people in open science thinking in Latin America? Many, many issues are similar, but many are very different. And it's really, really interesting to get those perspectives from different parts, of, different parts of the world. I think they, they really enrich uh, mm -hmm. our knowledge open science and I like what Paula was saying it's not just about the output it really is about the process of science and how do you how do you open up the entire process and the scientific enterprise as we say um, in mm -hmm. the science another question uh, I think is also related to to you coming from uh, UNESCO and the question is is there any initiative from intergovernmental agencies uh, to bring together a new internationalism for science um, uh, COVID or other global challenges harness open science. Institutions are doing this. Researchers are doing this. Who will take the lead? So would, for example, UNESCO be the right um, uh, institution to lead such a uh, movement? Well, um, 
it brings us a little bit to the question of, you know, what is the role uh, of UNESCO in, in global science? Um, and I think this standard setting function that we have is extremely important. Uh, and in that sense, yes, uh, UNESCO should be the, glo the global leader uh, in, in setting the standards, in, in bringing this international global dimension to scientific issues, including what is open science, what are the risks and benefits, uh, what are the actions to be, to be taken. Another important role that we have is really that we can bring people together. And um, it, it may sound something that is a, a, bit, a bit trivial, but it, but it really has a huge convening power, UNESCO. Uh, as I said, in a very brief amount of time, we can bring together 150 ministries of science, technology, innovation. So that there is power in that, and we can discuss certain issues. We can discuss, we, it can become a, and it is a forum to discuss some of the uh, some of the issues that concern how science is done across across the world. But I think in our case also what is always extremely important is that we work towards reducing the science technology innovation gaps between countries. So this is always like the bottom line of whatever we do and even when we approach open science it is from that perspective. We're trying to make sure that open science, which is happening now, uh, it's going to happen independently of who, whether UNESCO or not will come on board. But the reason why UNESCO is coming on board, make sure that that transition to open science, hopefully, or attempts to transition to open science, happens in a fair way and in an equitable way from which there will be benefits from both developed and developing countries. And that we are certain that open science is not going to increase, but decrease the gap in knowledge, in technology, innovation, and science between the different countries. Mm. Are the other speakers uh, on the panel are aware of intergovernmental activities um, on pushing the open science movement? I wish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I personally love to see more engagement from the United States um, in uh, broad consortia. You know, for example, I'm you know, encouraged to see funders coming together on open access regarding Plan S. Um, but I, uh, you know, I, I think um, I, certainly that's a hope that I'm carrying forward in our new administration. Yeah, to be um, If I may, maybe there are also non-governmental movements. Um, so just to mention Joggle, just one giant lab, um, who are developing, la for example, lamp tests and other tests. Um, to help support in in the global south, um, this is something I think very unique. Um, it's extremely low barrier access, and um, all of a sudden you are in collaboration with people from Europe, US, Africa, um, Central Asia, and. Um, you are just starting to develop things together and you send stuff across the globe um, just to make sure that these tests are working and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a very nice thing. I'm not a big part of this. I'm just sitting there on the side, but um, this is something that is going on right now and I think this shows the, the big power of openness really well. Thank you very much. I have now two questions which are related to open access, to the role of the publishers. And uh, by the way, the latest number of uh, visitors um, is 189, so almost 190 uh, attendees here to this panel. This is really a great success. Um, uh, so that's the big advantage of having a virtual conference because the reach is much, much higher as compared to an on-site event. So 190 attendees. Thank you very much for all your questions out there. And uh, the next questions, uh, I, I will read the two because they are related to one another. And um, uh, the first one is, can the open science movement be spared major commercial interests or will the same thing happen in the context of research data and other outcomes as in the area of open access to publications? So will we have a revival of the failure, so to say, um, with uh, how we dealt with the scientific uh, publications? And related to this, um, have the speakers been surprised 
to see mainstream news outlets reporting on preprints in relation to COVID-19. Do they need to be more cautious when doing so? Um, I, I can certainly try to address that last point. Um, in, in a sense, I don't think it is surprising at all, given the hunger for information about COVID-19 potential treatments, ways to avoid transmission. Um, I, I think it completely makes sense that um, with science uh, in preprint being in the open, that journalists and um, others would would uh, take that on. There's a wonderful analysis by Alice Fuerkers from um, Skullcom Lab, looking at the way that preprints are represented in different news outlets, and she's found that in many cases um, they're not very clearly represented as preprints. Um, so I think that there is a challenge, and one of the most fundamental challenges here is that the incentives for journalists don't necessarily align with conducting an independent purity process like you might want them to. Um, they've been accustomed to an embargo system where they have abundant time to look into a study, get extra uh, input before um, they can you know, reasonably publish. But with preprints, it is sort of a race to be first. And they're certainly under a lot of pressures and deadlines. Um, so I, I think that obviously, uh, you know, understanding mm. this, um, it, it's kind of, I think, uh, impossible to ensure that every news article that covers preprints is going to be completely um, responsible in all the ways that we would like to see. Uh, I think that ways of accommodating this are to, for preprint servers and other repositories, for example, the infamous Yan report alleging a uh, kind of, um, you know, human origin of COVID or a design origin of COVID was placed on Zenodo, um, which does not have a kind of, you know, up until very recently did not display a banner about what a preprint is and how things are screened. And, you know, again, uh, that repository um, functions extremely well for data. There is no kind of pre-moderation and, and so forth. And so um, I, I think that having those kind of uh, uh, sort of labels to help orient readers about what a preprint is, is extremely, um, extremely valuable and extremely important. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. Paula? Yeah, um, I, want, I want to add on that. I, I was also not surprised at all that all those preprints were picked up by media um, because uh, I, I've noticed this tendency of these days uh, in, in, in the or maybe I, sh I should express a wish of mine, the wish of, of, of seeing in the, in the media outlets uh, uh, a journalism that it's somehow also a bit more responsible and, and slower and doesn't necessarily um, catch uh, the, the fastest uh, piece of news uh, uh, at, at the highest velocity possible. I would like to have two or, or three news per day that I know uh, where the journalist has actually read, understood, uh, um, you know, um, verified the, the sources of the data, the sources of the information, uh, rather than having 150 little pieces of news uh, that are just, you know, uh, not very uh, reliable. So that's one thing. And the other thing that to me, the fact that all these preprints uh, uh, were not uh, always used with, with caution shows once again that there is a gap between science and society. I'm, I'm seeing this in this special uh, crisis because um, talking about preprints with family, with my family, uh, with my friends, uh, um, with colleagues uh, that not necessarily um, uh, have done a PhD or know what does it mean to publish an article, there's still a lot, a lot, a lot of people out there who don't know what a preprint is and why you shouldn't trust a preprint, who don't know what a peer review is. And you would expect instead of, but no, actually you wouldn't expect of a journalist to necessarily know that unless the journalist has an academic background or he's a scientific journalist who talks with scientists. So this dialogue, if this dialogue were in place and were more systematic, perhaps uh, also the, the abuse uh, of preprints uh, could be limited, together, of course, with very nice big red disclaimer that say, this has not been peer reviewed, do not cite, do not quote or whatever, you know, like, like Jessica was, was mentioning. Yeah, so uh, I come back to the question with the research data and whether we will le lose this race again uh, with the uh, uh, publishing uh, industry, um, uh, because another question popped up related to the current discussion. And um, uh, this uh, question is as follows. 
many um, uh, publishers, academic, scientific publishers, have provided, and this is indeed very true, free access to research during the pandemic and also offer open access publication op um, options. So that is also something we have experienced. So it's not only the preprint culture, it's also that the publishers have, you know, uh, uh, put an open access license on their um, uh, publications. And it's, there's something more that publishers can do. Well, I certainly think that they could uh, extend free access to all literature. Um, I would argue that COVID-19 is a really important uh, and pressing problem, but so is climate change, so is cancer. So there's, you know, there's, all research ideally um yeah. yeah so that is maybe a good example for open washing because here you know now the publishers if just to provoke they could argue okay we have made everything openly available because for the covid corona pandemic and you argue well you could have done the same for the climate change for you know whatever global crisis yeah, because one m might also argue, okay, they have opened up COVID-19 articles so for, for the emergency time. When are they going to be closed again? How much uh, permissive is the license? Can the data be reused? Uh, are these uh, Creative Commons distributed? I mean, is it actually open access? Is it just and fair? Or, you know, you label it as open access and well, I can sleep at night. Mm. It's a good question. Okay. Um, and there is still the open question on the research data. And um, uh, the question just repeated is uh, that um, uh, the th same thing happened in the context of research uh, data and other outcomes as in the area of open access publications. So, and indeed, uh, like within the uh, European Open Science Cloud Association, which is the association to, to set up and run the EOSC, we have a um, controversial debate on to what extent um, uh, companies with the uh, commercial objectives should be included into uh, uh, like uh, the membership and if so um, to what extent can they uh, become a, you know a member of a board of directors because they might you know steer things mm -hmm. in their um, or according to their commercial interests and as you know, the EOSC is very much about the research data management in Europe. Mm -hmm. So there is the risk. It's super controversially discussed um, at the European level. What's your opinion about that? Who wants I to mean, jump in? Uh, Anna, if, please. If I may, just uh, a little bit from our, and again, uh, it's, it's, it's from a higher policy level uh, at, our, at our side. Um, Again, it's a good thing that uh, things are, are discussed and that now there are some, uh, you know, good practices to build upon and there are some innovations to build upon. Um, and, and just because there is an issue, it doesn't mean that we cannot solve it, right? Uh, so if the tendency is for open data, open data like any other, you know, anything that is open is open in a certain context, right? So if that context is, is properly defined, if the communities agree, if there are agreements, etc. Uh, fair data is one of the ways of kind of uh, ex explaining and giving principles to what is open and how, but it's also a restriction, right? Open, uh, fair data is not all data. So um, I, I, th I think more and more we will have tools to talk to each other, to people who have different interests, different stakes, different stakeholders, in this area and it's not something to be afraid of because it's the reality of things so if we do want to um, move forward with it then that discussion has to be has to be taken and there are uh, hopefully good practices to be shared more and more coming up even with regards to the, the publishers and the way you know there are some attempts to open up as much as possible but they of course still have to be thinking about what their, what their, what their benefits so there are some new things to be to, to BSD, did you encounter in your research, uh, you know, um, uh, difficulties with accessing research data because it was, you know, somehow behind a whatever license wall, or is everything openly available for you? In your I mean, uh, in the in the general omics field, there are huge movements that you publish also your data. Um, 
and also your raw data. So this, I, I have to say, if it's published, it was available for me. Um, there's this huge database called Metabolites, for example, where metabolomics data is available. And um, so in this regard, I think also because the these yeah, disciplines are relatively new. And maybe there is a different culture um, from the start, to say. I mean, I, I would like to take uh, this part of the discussion to, to open up um, um, the view uh, towards like the world. And there's a question which says, how do you see contributions and research needs around Corona in Africa, Iberia, America, Asia, represented in the global race against the virus? Um, uh, I, I still remember it in the, when uh, the uh, pandemic uh, began um, uh, early last year, it was very difficult um, uh, to get any data from China for evaluation, like, for example, to what extent are uh, kids um, uh, affected by the virus? Um, are they more vulnerable than adults? We didn't get this information, even though the information um, we, we thought um, was available in, in China. So I think um, a global transparency of the data um, for, for in, in this particular case would have helped um, to also um, speed up the development of the vaccines. So how do you see uh, contributions and research needs um, uh, for the other parts of the world, not only in Europe or in the US, but uh, in the questions, it was mentioned Africa, Ibero, America and Asia. Um, I, I think uh, that um, what you call uh, a global transparency and global collaboration uh, is certainly a good desire, a good wish. But I also think it's important, like Anna was, was mentioning um, um, a few questions before, uh, um, that we, we, don't, we shouldn't overcome the local differences and the diversity of, of, the, of the communities, right? Um, so that's one thing. And the other thing, when I look at, um, when I look at science and the science that gets published uh, today, I see that one of the major obstacles to reach this, uh, this global transparency is sometimes the language. We tend to assume that everything that it's published on the web and that it's in English, it's the, you know, the real source, so it's in English, it's good. It's, it's, I, I know how to read it, most of us scientists mm -hmm to learn uh, how to speak English, even though it's not my, our mother tongue. But like this, we are overcoming a good portion of literature that it's published, that it's produced, uh, that it's that needs to stay in native languages because of uh, the dialogue with society, because of the dialogue with uh, uh, policymakers. So one of the things perhaps uh, um, would be to, to, to use, uh, uh, and these days with machines, we can do this, right? To, to translate and to try to, to keep our mind open beyond English, which of course we need because we need to all understand each other, but not not all the information and not all the resources uh, um, that the world needs uh, to overcome this crisis are out there in English. We should mm -hmm. not detach ourselves uh, from this idea. And I, sp I speak in premise uh, about myself. Yeah. Tobias, um, uh, do, do, did you encounter similar... Um, uh difficulties in, in your environment, like interoperability of the data. So if you want to access data from Africa or if Africa wants to access data from your side, that um, uh, like a point of failure is lack of interoperability. I mean, of course, interoperability is a, is a huge um, issue. But uh, for example, now in, in fighting the pandemic, there's a solution that was actually developed starting with uh, the Ebola crisis. Um, this is called SOMAS, and it's a pandemic management tool for the local public health service. Um, and these, uh, this, this opens up, it's also open source and um, compatible with DHIS2 and all these um, data standards that are available now. And for example, all of Nigeria is using it and mm. uh, Germany struggles to roll it out <laughs> at the moment. Um, but for example, France and Switzerland are using it and 
um, and Fiji is using it, and it's it's very yeah very broad, and I think it, this could be, for example, the nucleus for a global open data standard in this pandemic, actually. So this might be a good example for that. Of course, between other countries sharing these kinds of data is also yeah very difficult um, because of the lack of really well promoted standards, I would say. Just to add on this, uh, there is hope for the future because uh, in 2019 at a CoData conference in Beijing, the Global Open Science Cloud initiative uh, was kicked off. And the idea of that initiative is exactly to connect the regional activities with one another. And regional activities are, for example, the European Open Science Cloud, the Chinese Science and Technology Cloud, the African Open Science Platform or um, the Australian e-infrastructure, which is the term they use for their open science um, platform. So um, activities have started, have kicked off. It, of course, will take a while. Um, we have another like 15 minutes and I would like to uh, um, to address another topic which I prepared and which I consider to be important to be discussed here in the panel. So far, we discussed um, very much what science can offer to a society, to politics, uh, to itself. But now I would like to shed light on the benefits of and costs for science. So what does it cost for us if we engage in open science? For example, does science benefit from open science principle to help overcome global crisis? Is there really an advantage or will we end up in two class uh, in a two class science system some do open science invest a lot in communication a lot in transfer and there is another group which is doing excellent basic research getting like you know the higher cited highly cited uh, publications what's your position on that and i would like uh, all of you to to give a position statement to this um, uh, question who starts? You. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid somebody will copy the very humble uh, thought that I have. <laughs> no, um, I hope, I sincerely hope that open science will not, uh, will not act uh, uh, as a dividing factor. Uh, on the contrary, I hope that uh, open, transparent and collaborative practices will uh, uh, make scientists and researchers uh, talk more to each other and uh, be all on the same side, which is indeed uh, meet the goals and the needs of our society. We should, as Jessica said before, we should never forget this. So why do we do science? We do science to solve the challenges that we face. Of course, it's also a job. It, we need to pay our bills and so on and so forth. But that's why the, the focus and the mission is there. Having said that, um, I think that uh, doing open science uh, does not come without a price. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, responsibilities and tasks. If I publish a data set online, I can put it in a PDF um, and trapped in a table. That's not really what open data is. I should release the metadata. I should make sure it's readable by humans and it's readable by machines. I need to take care of choosing a proper license. I mean, I need to put efforts and time in this. As long as the system does not reward scientists for taking the time to do this, then we can perhaps start talking about um, a unifying factor. So the rewarding system is shifting. I believe personally that it needs to be shifting even faster towards the promotion of research integrity, transparency and collaboration in place of how many papers you published, the impact factor of, of the journals where you published, which we have been misused for way too long now. And okay. that was my concluding. Uh, Anna, what's your position on that? Uh, yeah, no, I think, uh, I mean, I, I agree with, uh, with, with Paula, uh, and, and I think we would all like to see a world where, you know, open science is science. Uh, but, uh, but it is true that th there will be a transition period, and that if within that transition period, there are th certain things, certain barriers maybe that need to be lifted or addressed that would allow for the entire scientific community 
uh, to be on board with uh, uh, with open science practices, etc. Certainly, the rewarding systems, evaluations of careers, um, is something that needs to be looked upon. Incentives. Uh, uh, all of these things, all of the system has to be in place to support open science. Again, it's not just the scientist that wants to put his data in open, uh, in, uh, a publication in open, open access or data out there that it, it's not enough. The system has to be in place, but it will take a little bit of time for that system to come in place and a little bit of learning to understand what is the right system in the right place for the right discipline, for the right actor. So, um, I think we have to be a little bit patient also uh, and, and allow this learning to happen uh, as well. Uh, and, and in the meantime, as, as, as you were saying, remember why we are doing all this and what the, purpose, uh, what the purpose of it is. It is to advance knowledge, even if it's not to address a specific need. One day, sooner or later, it might. But it is also to, to, to address specific needs of, of, of humanity. So. Um, that would be all from, from my side. Before I hand over to Jessica and Tobias, I just would like to make it more specific. I have been uh, um, uh, in uh, open science award committees, so we had to select uh, those who did the best open science performance in their research, and the criteria were not like um, high-ranked journals, it was not uh, you know, good conference publications or number of uh, PhDs which resulted from a specific project. It was re really very much um, science for and with a society, and there we have different criteria. And um, we have had uh, the uh, um, uh, talk of Hillary, who presented the Open Science Registry of uh, RDA, and I think there was a question from the audience which said, okay, isn't that a contribution to divide science into two parts, the open science part and the, uh, um, well, traditional uh, science um, uh, part. So um, uh, maybe uh, that this for a further um, uh, as a further trigger for uh, Jessica's and Tobias answers. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that um, I just want to echo uh, what has already been said on this point that I, I think that there are um, certainly uh, different communities that are practicing in different ways. So if you look at different fields, um, across different fields, there's different practices regarding data sharing. Uh, the adoption of preprints especially is something that does not occur um, all at once or at a, at a constant rate, but certain communities come together and they establish norms within their own communities. Uh, what, um, you know, how, how we practice science. Are we gonna post preprints? Are we gonna share our data? Um, and as this culture, um, that typically that happens um, not uniformly, but within these groups. Um, so I definitely think that um, over my, I'm very optimistic that over time, um, it, it, the, uh, it is it is going to be something that will be adopted um, because you know I think there is like a, a strong logic and a strong moral logic behind open science practices. Um, that I believe will prevail. Uh, I do think that to the point of kind of making it appear that there are two universes or that there is a distinction, um, I, I think that it is really important to, you know, to, to, to base this point earlier of measuring, of keeping track of things. Like it is, it, we need to create the um, impression that there is momentum. Um, and you know, by doing so, we may be highlighting the differences between um, certain entities that are supporting open science and others that are not. Um, but I do think that um, this is hopefully a unstable intermediate of a system that is in the process of evolution. Thank you. And uh, Tobias, what's your stake on this? Yeah, so it, it goes very much along the lines also with everybody and uh, especially Paola. Of course, um, we have a current reward system and the reward system is shifting and it's coming along with open science. And um, I'm in a very privileged place because Berlin with the BAH Quest Center and everything is is going really, I think, in the right direction. Um, so we, we I think um, we really need to come um, to, to, to come to an understanding that along with open science, you have many, many aspects shifting and there are many cultural changes 
going on right now. And of course, this takes a lot of time and a lot of effort, and you need people pulling it. Mm. Yeah. Um, it's a grassroots thing, and um, the grass has to push. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I would like to come to the closing question, and I apologize to the audience, to our 189 attendees out there, that I cannot take up all of the questions uh, you have posed in the chat. I have so many here, uh, they do not fit on one screen. I really have to scroll a while until I'm down of the um, list of questions. So uh, um, big apologies that I cannot go through all of them. And um, now the closing question to all of you um, would be the following one. Could you give a statement, a short statement, on what um, you have learned from the year? current pandemic in terms of open science and more important, how and where can we improve for the future? Paula, could you start? Um, I think uh, we have learned, or at least I see, uh, that we have learned that we can't afford anymore to choose. There is no question anymore, uh, should we do science openly or closed? Open science is the way to go. And I believe we are all on the same page now. And the other thing that uh, the lesson also learned, uh, and that's what I believe we need to do a bit better, is how do we make open science a reality? What are the tools and the services, the infrastructures, the resources that we need to be able to do it in a conscious and responsible way, which is not just uh, preprinting and I'm done, but it's really putting all these uh, skills uh, and these blocks together to make sure that we transition to it in a in a conscious, responsible way. Thank you. Um, Anna, would you like to give your final statement? Yeah, sure. Uh, no, I, I also think that we've seen from the uh, uh, from this crisis that open science definitely is the way to go, but it has also shown some of the challenges that we do have uh, when things are open, when things are out there. And we, uh, I think to be sure that uh, open science happens in the best possible way and reaches the objectives and its potential, we have to address some of these challenges and we really have to forge these partnerships among the different players in the open science uh, um, field. There are many of them. We've learned about some that we didn't even know were there before this uh, crisis. And now the question is, how do we pull them all together so that we are all going in the same direction or growing in the same way as uh, Tobias was saying before? Tobias, it's your turn. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <clears throat> all this, this openness also um, provokes a lot of trust. And mm -hmm. I think this is one thing we, we can build upon. And of course, now that the scientific process is so much in the focus of the general public, um, I think this also gives a new flashlight onto the process itself and um, where maybe there are difficulties in this process. And again, the reward system, but what is good open science is also not really defined when we are honest. And mm -hmm. there are no, no tokens or badges you receive or something. Um, and we... It, it will come, but also this comes then again from our experiences and experience takes time, of course. So, yeah. Thank you very much. And Jessica, you have the final word before I close the panel. Um, just to echo what others have said, um, open science has been really essential in the COVID-19 crisis, but it's also shown us that we can't just view open science as putting our work out there and considering that done, there needs to be a process of open communication, of open feedback, of public peer review, uh, an acknowledgement that science is changing. Uh, we need to help readers and our colleagues uh, accelerate that process and make it as robust as possible. Thank you very much. I would like uh, to thank all of you. Um, and I've learned from uh, David that we can give a digital applause. And I'm sure the 100 
90 people around the world I will also congratulate you for your great contributions. Thank you very much also to our attendees for their, the many questions they have raised. So that was indeed a very um, inspiring um, panel discussion. Um, uh, thanks a lot. And uh, thanks again to you, Paula, Jessica, Anna and Tobias. And I close the panel and hand over back to David. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.